Ethics is the systematic study of moral ideas, values, and principles. Also known as moral philosophy, it is concerned with the norms of human living, personal, social, and universal, as well as the underlying logic of our judgments of right and wrong behavior. Ethics is one of three main branches of philosophy the others being metaphysics, the study of what there is, and epistemology, the study of how we know what there is. Moral philosophy, however, is not concerned with what is the case, but with what ought to be the case. Put another way, ethics is the study of what's right and what's wrong, and as such, cuts to the core of our identity as free thinking creatures. Ethics, as I understand it, is a philosophical theory um, about how we ought to live and how we ought to act. And uh, it's concerned with the foundations uh, of how uh, you know, uh, people should organize their lives. Philosophers usually divide the field of ethics into three areas. Meta-ethics, normative ethics, and applied ethics. All of these areas have their own sets of questions they address, and their own intellectual traditions that reach far back into human culture. Meta-ethics investigates the origin and nature of ethical concepts and the language we use to talk about them. Are our ideas of right and wrong eternal and universal values independent of the human will? Or are they the result of human conventions, which in turn are based on constantly shifting historical and social circumstances? Should we try to discover universal values that all human beings can abide by? Or are all ethical systems inevitably bound to the particular values of each society? Should moral maxims be the same for all? Or should they take into account the particular emotional constitution, needs, and preferences of each individual? The nature of moral language is of critical concern to meta-ethics. When someone says, for example, abortion is wrong, what is she actually saying? there are two possibilities. She is either making a statement that can be true or false, or she is making a statement that can't be true or false. The theory that allows the first kind of statement is called cognitivism. According to cognitivism, when someone says abortion is wrong, she is describing a fact about the world, and her statement can be verified as either true or false. Non-cognitivist views deny that moral claims can be true or false. One kind of non-cognitivist view holds that moral claims are prescriptions, commands to act or desist from acting. Moral claims are like the command, shut the door, or clean your room. In either case, when someone says abortion is wrong, she is saying abortion, don't do it. 
According to prescriptivism, there is no fact that abortion is wrong. There is only a command relating to an action. Do this or don't do that. Considered by many to be the father of non-cognitivism, the Scottish philosopher David Hume believed that moral virtue and vice did not exist out there in the world, but were instead feelings within us that we spread onto the world. The morality or immorality of a particular act is, according to Hume, determined by a feeling we have when we view or think about the act. If we get a positive feeling, the act is morally good. If we get a negative feeling, the act is morally bad. Despite their subjective nature, Hume's view was that these feelings were not haphazard. It is part of being human, part of human nature that every unbiased, non-defective person would feel pain at witnessing acts of torture, murder, or unkindness, and the like. If morality had naturally no influence on human passions and actions, twere in vain to take such pains to inculcate it. And nothing would be more fruitless than that multitude of rules and precepts with which all moralists abound. Hume believed that the province of reason was to discover truths about the external world. Since morality was a matter of feelings inside of us, he held that reason was fundamentally divorced from morality. Hence Hume's famous saying, "'Tis not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of one's finger. The tremendous gulf between cognitivist and non-cognitivist views of ethics is symptomatic of the deep divisions that exist among moral worldviews. Some people think morality is an agreement between more or less equal adults, or equally rational beings in interchange with each other. Um, some people believe morality is something that we project on the world. We have feelings or attitudes, and then we say of something that it's good or bad, and what that reflects is that I like it or I don't like it. Um, and some people believe, I'm one of these, that there are actually truths about morality, objective truths. They're very difficult to determine sometimes, um, but they're, as it were, discovered rather than invented. This is a big schism in moral philosophy among theorists. Those who believe, in essence, that in one form or another morality is invented, and those who believe that in one form or another morality, like mathematics, is uh, discovered, moral truth. Metaethics has an intellectual heritage that can be traced back to the dawn of Western philosophy. Socrates, as portrayed in Plato's dialogues, was deeply concerned with the grounds of ethical conduct and tried to respond to what he perceived as the moral relativism of his contemporaries, especially the sophists. Plato had this, raised a series of fantastic questions in the Republic, questions that philosophers have struggled with ever since. And the crucial question, one of the crucial questions was the question, why should I be moral? Philosophers want to know. People want to know. Why should I be moral? In the story of the Ring of Gyges, recounted in The Republic, Socrates and his disciple, Glaucon, tried to figure out whether it is preferable to be just or to be unjust. In the story, Gyges is a shepherd who finds a gold ring that, when he puts it on, makes him invisible. Spellbound by the power of this ring, he keeps it in secret and goes to the palace. There, using the ring, he seduces the queen, kills the king, and seizes the throne. The question posed in the dialogue is whether any man in possession of such a ring would act justly and not take advantage of its properties. Mm -hmm. 
If so, it would surely prove that it is possible to be just for the sake of justice and not simply out of fear of punishment. Glaucon argues that no man in possession of the Ring of Gyges would choose to act justly. He makes further claims. He says that the person who would act, the person with such power, so much power they could do whatever they wanted, but who continued to act justly, we would praise such a man, but we would think him an idiot. He says further that no man who is worthy to be called a man would follow the laws of morality and convention and justice if he were able to get away with acting otherwise. He adds more to this story in the mouth of Glaucon. He considers two different cases. He considers a just man, who's in fact completely just, but everybody thinks he's unjust. And as a result of thinking him unjust, they scorn him, and they put him out, and they actually end up torturing him. He loses all his money, he loses all his family, he loses all his job, all his friends, everything. In the end, he gets tortured and impaled and dies a miserable death. But he's perfectly just. He's just thought to be unjust. And then he considers the per man who's perfectly unjust, completely unjust. But he has the appearance of being just. Everybody thinks he's just. As a result, he can give contracts to his friends. He can marry whoever he wants. He can sleep with whoever he wants. He can do and get away with anything because everyone thinks he's so just. Glaucon says, show me, Socrates. Show me, Socrates, that there's something to be said for acting justly. The dialogue attempts to demonstrate that justice matters enough to override other values. For Plato, the crucial issue is the nature of justice itself. Everyone has it in them to act justly, or unjustly for that matter. But before a person can make that choice, she must know what these terms mean. The challenge of ethics, then, is to establish the nature of the good so that we can then judge whether particular acts are good or bad. He tries to persuade us of a particular definition of justice and he's thinking of justice as a character tray. He's thinking of a person's justice and he defines it as a matter of having the emotional parts of you and the rational parts of you all doing their proper job and not interfering with each other. Reason should be doing its own proper job, which is to be in control of the emotional parts of the soul and uh, keeping them doing the right thing. The second major branch of ethics is normative ethics. Justice physics is the study of the fundamental principles governing the way the world is. Normative ethics is the study of the fundamental principles governing how one should live, how the world ought to be. The question is where these fundamental principles come from. Some think that what we ought to do is obey the will of God. Others insist that the moral life consists of doing one's duty. Others think we ought to make as many people as happy as possible. Still others think that the moral life is the life governed by virtues like generosity, honesty, and courage. I would characterize normative ethics as the search for fundamental principles, factors, rarely rules, but perhaps sometimes rules, that underlie right, the judgments about what is acts, what particular acts are right or wrong, or what particular uh, decisions we should make in context. So we're searching for, for fundamentals. Now, this doesn't mean that there's just one rule or one principle, though some people have held that that's so. So, for example, um, some philosophers have thought uh, that the fundamental principle is to maximize happiness, okay, minimize pain. 
Historically, moral philosophers have tried to develop normative ethical systems that include rules or standards by which one can judge particular acts and determine what to do in specific situations. There are four major areas of normative ethics. Virtue theory, divine command theory, utilitarian theory, and duty theory. In general, ancient ethics differs from modern ethics in that it is eudaimonistic. Aristotle in particular considered happiness, eudaimonia in Greek, as the legitimate aim of any moral action. Aristotle identified three different kinds of goods that we strive for, external possessions, the goods of the body, and the goods of the soul. The most important are the goods of the soul, for the soul is the seat of reason. Reason for Aristotle is the highest part of man. Reason more than anything else, Aristotle said, is man. Reason is the divine part of man. So this capacity to reason, which enables us to engage in what Aristotle called the contemplative life, the highest form of life for man, and which also allowed us to have things like religion, language, and morality, this is part of what we need to develop in order to really achieve as we humans are capable of achieving. Aristotle rejected the universal idea of the good, holding that what is good cannot be identical for all men. For each individual, the good is different in each activity and in each art. If the aim of medicine is health, the corresponding good is the healing of the patient. If the aim of strategy is victory, the corresponding good is the efficient handling of the military forces. So in each and every action and decision, good is the function which helps achieve the desired aim. A good person performs reasonable actions, and the corresponding good is what we call virtue. Aristotle claimed that for an act to be moral, it must be the result of a conscious decision. Therefore, free will is a necessary condition for an act to be considered moral. If you can't exert your will, your actions cannot be morally condemned. Aristotle has been found very attractive recently by ethical philosophers. A very central part of his work on ethics has to do with how to be good people. His ethics is not couched very much in terms of right and wrong, which are ideas that have been prominent in recent centuries. It's couched in terms of practicing virtue, and many people have found this attractive. I don't think that rules in ethics are going to both be informative and work. Of course, uh, there are philosophers who think that way. I think Kant was one of them. He thought that there were rules in ethics. But Aristotle thinks that rules, except rather specific rules, aren't going to work. Rather, what you should do is this. You've got to work out what's most important in life. And then, instead of having a set of rules, you've got to be able to spot. Now, only a few people are good at spotting. But there are people who are good at spotting. There are people who are phronemoi, to use the Greek plural word, who are wise men. And if you don't feel you're a wise person yourself, the best thing you can do is to look around for a wise person to guide you. It is by doing just acts that the just man is produced, and by doing temperate acts 
the temperate man. Without doing these, no one would have even a prospect of becoming good. But most people do not do these, but take refuge in theory and think they are being philosophers and will become good in this way behaving somewhat like patients who listen attentively to their doctors, but do none of the things they are ordered to do. Aristotle also advanced the principle of the golden mean. According to Aristotle, for every human disposition or desire, there are those who are too extreme in some way, too quick to anger at perceived insults, for example, or too mild in the face of injustice. The virtuous character consists of finding the way of moderation that avoids the vice of both extremes. Thus, we should neither squander our money irresponsibly, nor should we be so tight-fisted that we share nothing with others. Generosity is the golden mean between these two extremes. After Aristotle's death, his ideas were taken up by thinkers such as Epicurus, who rejected extreme hedonism and advocated instead for pleasure guided by the sobriety of reason. He held that transparency is the litmus test for ethical behavior. Commit no act that you would want to hide from others. The just man is the freest of all men from disquietude but the unjust man is a perpetual prey to it. Divine command theories of ethics hold that the principles that guide our behavior come from the will of God. During the Middle Ages, divine command theories dominated and moral philosophy was essentially an offshoot of religion and theology. For medieval theorists, ethical principles derived from the Holy Scriptures. The alternative to doing good was to sin, and the goal of morality was the eternal salvation of the soul. Now, one of the things worth keeping in mind is that some people, when they think about ethics, think about ethics in the context of a church or a religion or, in particular, a god. So many people will think, well, I can't even imagine asking ethical questions without invoking or talking about God. What is it that God's telling us to do what we ought to do? Philosophers ask questions that are ethical questions. What ought we to do? What makes a person vicious or virtuous? What makes an outcome good or bad? Uh, but they tend to do it in a context divorced from presuppositions about God. Um, so most of contemporary moral philosophy, although there are many moral philosophers or ethicists who are believers of one form or another, often devout believers. Uh, they still raise the ethical questions without embedded in the larger question of uh, what is it that God says or what is it that my religion says. Divine command theories can range from weak versions in which, for example, God's commands apply only within the context of a religious community to strong divine command theories in which human behavior is good if and only if it is willed by God. Plato addressed the question of whether God wills the good because it is good in the dialogue with Euthypro. Plato doesn't appeal to the laws commanded by God, he really goes the other way and appeals to the good. He says at one point uh, that everybody, um, in whatever they do, is seeking the good. He doesn't mean by that everybody seeking to be morally good. He means something much more plausible, that whatever you do, you see some good in it for you. Uh, perhaps not moral good, perhaps pleasure or something quite different. But you're always after what you 
see as good. And uh, so it's goodness that he concentrates on rather than God's commands. Of course, in the Jewish and Christian tradition, with the Ten Commandments and other commandments uh, given uh, earlier to, to Noah, uh, the commands of God became very, very much more important. In the 19th century, a series of British philosophers developed autonomous ethical theories that judge the morality of actions based on the consequences those actions bring about, rather than on the intentions or the character of the doer. Their new approach to normative ethics came to be known as consequentialism. The best known version of consequentialism is utilitarianism. A very famous form of consequentialism is known as utilitarianism. And that's a particular theory of value tacked on to the consequentialist structure. The right act is the one that produces the best consequences where best is judged as produces happiness, eliminates pain. Sometimes this is referred to as welfareism. Although the roots of utilitarian thinking can be traced back to Plato, the British philosopher Jeremy Bentham is considered to be the founder of this movement. Bentham, who argued passionately for legal and social reforms, said that an act was moral if it tended to produce the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. For Bentham, happiness was equivalent to pleasure, and he proposed what he called a felicity calculus to measure the happiness of individuals and communities and, by extension, the rightness or wrongness of an action. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. John Stuart Mill, an adherent of Bentham's view, believed that everyone is a utilitarian at heart, even if they don't know it. He defended his view from the criticism that utilitarians are pleasure seekers, asserting that, in fact, the utilitarian standard is not the individual's own greatest happiness, but rather the greatest amount of happiness altogether. Utilitarianism requires that, when necessary, a person act against his or her own best interests in favor of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Unlike Bentham, Mill distinguished between pleasures not only by their degree of intensity, but also by their quality. The pleasure of an animal does not have the same value as a human being's pleasure. Individuals should take into account the quality of the pleasures they seek when making moral choices. It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool or the pig are of a different opinion, it is because they know only their side of the question. There have been many forms of utilitarianism put forth over the last two centuries. Mill himself moved beyond what is called act utilitarianism into rule utilitarianism, proposing that the utilitarian principle should be used mainly in determining the value of rules such as do not kill, do not lie, or do not steal. We should judge acts by their compliance with general rules of this kind. Mill also believed that every individual has sovereignty over his or her own body, psyche, and spirit. Therefore, only behavior that affects other people can be subject to moral judgment. Implicit in this idea is a strong claim for broadening the scope of an individual's private life, an important development in modern ethics. A major criticism of Mill's position comes from English philosopher G.E. Moore, 
who claim that utility is a property of good things, but not a synonym for good. According to Moore, neither pleasure nor happiness nor utility can define the morality of our actions. Nothing can possibly be conceived in the world, or even out of it, which can be called good, without qualification, except a good will. Deontology is the study of duty. A deontologist believes that the rightness or wrongness of an action is independent from its consequences. In the 18th century, the Prussian philosopher Immanuel Kant introduced a deontological model which identified the fulfillment of duty as the basis for ethics. Kant is, you know, one of the great, the greatest of the deontologists in many ways. And Kant actually argues that the rightness or wrongness of the act doesn't depend at all on the consequences. Kant says famously things like, let justice be done though the heaven should fall. The consequences don't matter at all. What matters is that you act rightly, that you act with the pure and good will, that you do your duty. Kant put forth an ethical law to rationally guide our actions. He called this law the categorical imperative. For Kant, the autonomy of the will is the guiding principle of all moral laws and all duties stemming from them. It is the guarantee of a person's dignity and equality under the law. Act in such a way that the maxim of your action can be willed as a universal law. So Kant famously gives the shopkeeper example. He distinguishes between a shopkeeper who gives the correct change to a young child who won't know whether he got the correct change or not. Because he lives in a small town, and he knows that the child will take the money home with a loaf of bread, and the mother will say, where's the rest of my change? And the child will say, this is all I got. And the mother will beat the child and say, you, you probably spent it on bubble gum or some other such thing. And we all recognize that. Sooner or later, it comes out that this isn't the only child who supposedly bought bubble gum. A bunch of other children bought bubble gum, and then pretty soon the mothers are comparing notes, and they're thinking, oh my gosh, I beat my child. I was wrong. I ought not to have done it. They really weren't given the correct change. It's the shopkeeper's fault. And then, of course, they'd run the shopkeeper out of town, or they do whatever they want to the shopkeeper, or they simply stop shopping at the shopkeeper's shop. Kant says the shopkeeper might well give the correct change to the little child who doesn't know whether it's the correct change or not for prudential reasons, for self-interested reasons, because it's good business to do that, because mom will come back to the store when the shopkeeper appears to be honest. But if that's the only reason he gives the correct change, Kant says, he's not deserving of moral praise. He's deserving of moral praise when he gives the correct change, not because it's good for business, but because it's the right thing to do. You know, Kant uh, thought of ethics as a practical reason. It was the same reason that was involved, on his, in his view, in our inquiries in theory, you know, in mathematics, in logic, in science, right? Uh, but it was practical because uh, it had to do with our deciding how we will behave on the basis of how we ought to behave. The German philosopher George Hegel took issue with the Kantian model, claiming that his ethics were too abstract and individualistic. He held that the sphere of the ethical is contained within the sphere of the social, and that both of these are within the sphere of the state. Later in the 19th century, the German philosopher Karl Marx charged that what society called morality was nothing but an ideological construction designed to justify and facilitate oppression of the poor at the hands of the wealthy. In every society, there is a dominant ideology, and the prevailing morality is that of the class that wields power. Another German philosopher of the late 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche, thought just the opposite. 
Nietzsche argued that morality was a clever trick of the faint-hearted to defend themselves against the powerful, a means of restraining the strong from dominion over the weak. In contemporary normative ethics, a fine line of thinking called formalism has emerged, which holds that our pursuit of personal interests or the common good does not constitute the ultimate horizon of moral philosophy. Formalist ethics doesn't focus on the context of law, but rather on its form, stressing the procedures that sustain life in a social context. The philosopher John Rawls was a prominent advocate of this approach. The definition of good is purely formal. It simply states that for an individual, good is determined by the rational plan of life such person would choose, with deliberative reason, among plans of the greatest possible value. So what needs to be established is what is rational for those in a well-ordered society as a means of asserting their sense of justice as regulatory of their plan of life. I think that uh, the theory of justice uh, is very much tied to a certain conception of persons uh, and what we owe people. Okay. So in that sense, uh, its foundations lie in ethical theory. It's just that you have to think what people owe each other when they're not dealing with each other in one-on-one -on -one context, but um, getting some sort of an agreement to the basic rules that govern the interaction of large numbers of people who never interact with each other personally and whose relationships with each other are mediated by their relationship to a government, right? So there's no doubt that there must be, I think, a fundamental ethical view that underlies a political theory. Um, but some people, in particular the ph political philosopher Rawls, have warned us about too tightly connecting our judgments about one-on-one -on -one individual cases, right? What I owe someone who I've made a promise to, for example, with large-scale um, uh, political institutions and what our obligations are as citizens. Another movement of the 20th century is communitarianism, which holds that the key to parsing ethical issues resides in the fact that individuals live inside social frameworks. Having renounced the quest for universal agreement, the communitarian view argues that the work of ethics lies in placing moral reasoning within the context of a community's traditions and cultural institutions. The simplest view says, look, morality is invention, and it reflects agreements between people. Different groups of people get together and they say, what is it, how do we want to lead our lives? Uh, what do we believe in? What do we want to believe in? What do we want to teach our children? How do we want our children to uh, lead their lives? And then we'll come to an agreement on the principles that we believe in. We might believe in principles of liberty or equality, or we might not. We might believe in principles of uh, fairness or justice, or we might not. We might believe that what we ought to do is uh, to maximize the general welfare of the members of our society. And then we might come together on this particular version of view, a social convention view, and I have certain beliefs, and you have certain beliefs, and we come to an agreement between us. I say, well, we ought to put weight on freedom, and you say we ought to put weight on equality, and we have a disagreement between us. And then we sort of discuss it with each other, and we decide, how much do we care about this? How, how important is it to me, for example, to come to an agreement with you about this topic. There are, of course, tremendous pressures that we live in a society that gets along, that has cohesion. The debate in ethics today is largely between consequentialists and the formalist approach known as contractualism, which is strongly influenced by the work of John Rawls. While they differ on the criteria or process of judging the rightness or wrongness of an action, both views agree that ethics should be separate from religion and cultural traditions. 
the scope of ethics has expanded throughout the centuries, reformulating its basic questions in the language of the age. And yet, despite a centuries-old ongoing dialogue, questions about the relationship between virtue and happiness are still hotly debated. But this is a very important question. What is it that really matters when you talk about happiness or the good or human welfare? And, and humans differ about this markedly. There are many, many students in my classes, many, many parents, many, many people who say, well, after all, isn't happiness all that matters? Don't, well, isn't what we want for our children, for our family, for the people we care about, is that they should be happy? You know, other people think, no, happiness is important, but it isn't all that matters. Other things matter as well. An accusation often leveled against philosophy in general is that the questions it addresses are esoteric and abstract, too focused on hypotheticals and not on the everyday lives of everyday people. Whatever the merits of this argument in general, it certainly cannot be true of applied ethics. Here, philosophy confronts head-on the dilemmas and decisions that are the fabric of our very existence. Here, moral theory dives into the confused sea of impassioned viewpoints and the kind of fundamental choices that define who we are. Here, we find the hard questions that spur heated debate, such as, is animal testing morally defensible? Who is responsible for environmental stewardship? To whom are business leaders ultimately beholden? What is our obligation to future generations? Should the state be allowed to take the lives of its own citizens? Is euthanasia ever morally acceptable? When opposing groups take stands on these issues, they often disagree about fundamental meta-ethical ideas and normative principles that guide decision-making. In the example of abortion, we are confronted with a conflict between two positive normative principles, the principle of protecting the life of the fetus and the principle of a woman's freedom to determine what happens to her body. Inevitably, we must ask what life is, when it starts, and what level of control should society have over individuals. In daily life, and also when we think about public policy, we very often have to deal with pe what people think ought to be done. And it's not just a question of um, what will save us the most money, uh, oughts in that sense, okay? but. Um, what we think uh, we are required to do or prohibited from doing. So, for example, the problem of abortion. Many people think that, well, even if it would make life a lot easier for many people, it's simply wrong. Okay? And other people say that it's, it's quite permissible. Um, in uh, assisted suicide, the debate has gone on in the law but also in ethics. Is it permissible to help someone to end their life in certain circumstances? Um, business people may face ethical questions. Uh, they would maximize the profit of their company. They have a duty to their shareholders. They think that as some people speak of it, there is a role responsibility. There's a certain ethics of being in a certain role. You're the chairman of the board. You owe something to your you know, shareholders. But selling this product would endanger the health of young children abroad, a milk formula or something of that sort. Um, what must you really do in these circumstances? Applied ethics has been divided into various subfields, such as bioethics and medical ethics, business ethics, social ethics, the ethics of sex, and environmental ethics. And as technology develops, new ethical problems will inevitably arise. 
if we are able to create truly conscious machines, should they have the status of persons? Is cloning a legitimate way to overcome human mortality? Is it enough for science to be able to do something for us to declare it permissible? More and more philosophers are being called on to participate in the arguments and in the decision-making process. In hospitals, there are ethicists on call. Um, there are philosophers consulting in business corporations, um, especially now with various ethical dilemmas that have been faced, the accounting profession and so forth. There are programs at uh, major universities on ethics and the professions. Um, where philosophers and people in other disciplines, of course doctors, lawyers, but also engineers, architects, business people, um, discuss these issues together. And uh, there's an attempt to introduce real philosophical rigor, right, uh, into what an area that used to just be handled with what were known as professional codes, right, where there was no attempt to dig really deep into the foundations of the code, and also to work out in rigorous detail what the implications, right, of the foundational theory should be for particular cases. Now that's changing because of this interaction between uh, professional philosophers and people in other disciplines. And so it is that the moral theories that philosophers and students ponder in the halls of academia come face to face with the real world issues we confront in our lives. Here is an aspect of philosophy that, whether we are aware of it or not, all of us contribute to by virtue of making decisions every day that affect the lives of others. The study of ethics engenders a deeper understanding of what it means to make a choice and what it means to be human. I very much care about ethics and ethical theory and it's intellectually demanding and exciting and it's also very worthwhile because you can actually help, I think, with practical problems.